In this edition of Garden Talk with the Tulsa Master Gardeners, we begin a new multi-part series on garden pests by talking about aphids. Our plant this time is the Joe Pie Weed. Then, we'll talk about starting seeds for your vegetable garden and answer questions about cats in your garden and borers in peach trees. Welcome to Garden Talk. Welcome back to this edition of Garden Talk with the Tulsa Master Gardeners. How you doing? We're, we're March. We're March. Like, we got like this countdown to spring and I guess daylight savings time. I can and feel it. I can feel it outside. It's like we, we've made it we, at this point. That's good. Right? That's good. It I feels like we've made it. Tom, I tilled my garden a couple weeks ago, well, so it, you know it's getting you, time. You're, you're, a, you're ahead of the curve. <laughs> I had too many weeds in it. I had, to, <laughs> I had to clean them up a little bit. The neighbors were calling <laughs> yeah. the city and complaining about it. No, yeah. anyway. no it is spring. It's, it's happening. Um, we're going to have a good, good March in April, and uh, well, we're ready for it. So, so we're ready. Now yeah. we got stuff to talk about here because we're in garden season. So Absolutely. we're going to start a new series. We did a series last time on uh, tomato disease. We'll do another multi-part season on uh, different insects, yep, yep. Bugs, insects. bugs, insects. Each week we'll take a different class of bug. Well, today we're going to start with aphids, and then we'll do bug, true bugs. There's a difference yep. between a bug and a true bug, That's and then correct. caterpillars. Or, anyway, so we'll kind of knock through all those so you know what to do. But today we're going to start with aphids. Our yep. pest of the week, I guess, is, is aphids, and these guys... Whew. I, it's probably the most common insect we have in in the gardens. I mean, it, it's it. You will see them on everything. They're really. relentless. Yeah, I mean, and if that, you see one, you're going to see a bunch. There's a lot right. of them, and you know, if you see one out on a stem, if you turn a leaf over, and you probably will see hundreds more if you're right. if you're not careful. But but aphids, they're a they're a small, soft bodied insect. Right. Uh, kind of kind of a tubular shaped uh, insect where they've got a you know they they pierce into right. the Piercing, leaf, sucking, go into the leaf, suck right. the juices out. So right. I mean that 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 you know that right there provides us some some issues, transmitting some diseases. Um, but I mean that that's that's minor. But I think you know the aphids they just they just they win with numbers. Uh, right. Win with numbers. I mean you can see on the picture that you know it's pretty common to have 50 on a leaf if you're if you're damaged. So. I right. think this particular one, uh, that, that may be... Kind of looks like a milkweed. Milkweed, and, and they're pretty notorious for They getting, love milkweed. Getting I had milkweed, milkweed last year, and uh, I was all happy to have my milkweed, and I looked out there, and I was like, oh my, they changed orange. The milkweed <laughs> turned orange with yeah. these guys. Yeah, so there's a few varieties, you know, it's not, don't get too wound down on the variety, you know, right. which kind they are, um, but, you know, they're all going to do the same. They're going to pierce suck, they're going to suck juices, so that's going to slow the plant down, and then they're going to spit out babies live babies that are almost ready to feed so they'll spit out you know five to fifty a day um, mm -hmm. sounds like a lot but you know it is and uh, they'll they'll keep spitting them out uh, until you know they hit that life cycle and uh, right. that, that's one of the reasons why you know they they are so they are win they do win in the garden because of their numbers sheer numbers right and then and the, we got a picture in the here they're orange, but they will be in different colors. And, you know, especially as they're tiny, they may. Yeah, there's a up. there's a green peach aphid that, that right. that's green. I mean, like I said, there's about five to ten different there species that we aphids. have, but but I, I don't tend to, to to dwell on that too much. But the you know the one thing is is people I'm going to spray them, so they're gonna they're gonna go get a chemical. It's probably a broadcast uh, a broad spectrum spray that they're going to spray. Well, what we're doing, we're killing everything out there, right. including the uh, beneficials and right. that's one thing that makes this population blow up we may spray them on a Monday and then come back on a Friday and they've blown back up again and what's happened we've killed a lot of our beneficials that are feeding on these soft-bodied aphids and keeping our keeping our uh, population in check so we got to be careful when we're applying insecticides for these they're pretty easy to kill We've just got to be cognizant of the the beneficials that we have out there. Well, and especially like me and my milkweed and other people grow milkweed. I mean, you're growing the milkweed for the monarchs. Yeah. Yep. And if you get out there and spray the milkweed to get rid of the aphids, you're not going to really be helping the monarchs very much. No, no, so, it, it, it won't. At all. It won't. So, so you, you have got, to do kind of these lesser 
lesser type uh, insecticide or le lesser damaging strategies. Yeah, I guess. yeah, and I mean there are, and and you know I think on our control recommendations that we have, you know one of the first things that always comes to mind is is a stream of water. Right, seems they're crazy, pretty, but yeah. they're pretty fat and clumsy. I I can kind of relate a little bit sometimes, <laughs> but you can take a stream of water or you know your water hose and just kind of wash them off. Right, it'll knock them down. They're pretty clumsy to get back up let that plant take off and you know right. and, and go so that's probably your first step probably the easiest and uh it it, it will work it will work so. it will work and you like but you're gonna have to repeat that yeah i mean you're not it's not a one and done yeah. you're gonna be back out there what every three four days or something to yeah coverage is essential you know whether we're using we're talking the, the water or the oil or insecticide because they are down underneath those leaves so when we spray that water or that stream be sure and get underneath as much as you can Under. and then they'll finally find their way back um more will will come and um, you may be able to do this for a couple of weeks, but you may have to go to some soaps or some oils um, right. that that kind of helps control them a little bit more. Like insecticidal soap. Okay. Horticultural oil, neem oil. That's correct, right. correct. So the soap does what it does with most other insects. It gets on them and it, and it dries them out. It does. It allows them to desiccate basically and die. So they, that dries out from the inside. So that soap right. releases that skin or that outer covering of them and, and, and will we'll kill them that way. Right. So that's the soap, insecticidal soap. Uh, horticultural oil kind of works as a smother. It gets on and kind of smothers their skin. Right. So it kind of suffocates them. So that that can help pretty well, pretty good as well. Yeah, then, but, but both of those are uh, contact. Yeah. Insecticide. You have to spray on them. You can't spray and then hope it'll they'll, it'll get on them. You have yeah. to spray on. It's them. got to get on them and coat coat them essentially. And as and like you mentioned, the the underside of the leaves. If they're under the leaves and you spray the top of the leaves, they just it's like they wore an umbrella yeah. Yeah. and they were protected they're, from. They're just waiting. They're just fine. Yeah. They'll be they'll yeah. be back out. So yeah. you have to spray under and above and basically just soak the. Soak the, soak the plant. Soak the plant. Soak the plant up yep. and down and all around and everywhere. You know, normally, you know, in the summertime, we would we would kind of have a caution on watch the oils because we don't want to use too heavy of an oil, too heavy of right. a horticultural oil, um, because it can suffocate the plant. But you know, this time of year, it's 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 not too bad. Um, we're still cool enough. We're you know we're we're um, the plant plant can survive pretty good with that old horticultural oil. So right. we're in good shape on that. Right, and then there's always. Uh, IPM, Integrated Pest mm -hmm. Management Strategy. Mm -hmm. well, this, I guess this will be included in that strategy as well, but right. ladybugs. Yeah. Ladybugs will love them and eat them, and uh, I feel like 50, 50 a day or something. A lot of them. A they, lot of they'll them they'll feed a lot. They are soft-bodied, so they can poke in there. And another one besides ladybugs are lacewings. Really? Lacewings are kind of fun, and you can find those. I've seen them at some of the garden centers. Um, maybe not as early in the season, but, you know, mid-season we can find some lacewings in there. Um, but they're, they're a pretty neat pretty neat when they're uh, lacewing lions is what they call wow. uh, as well as the larvae of ladybugs they're pretty voracious ferocious feeders right. like you said 10 to 50 to 50 even a more a day right. um, so that's the ones we're protecting we don't want to just spray an insecticide we've got to protect those because there's enough of those out there especially as the population of the aphids get higher that population of the of the naturals uh, beneficials will do good as well. So be careful spraying. Just just don't over spray. You know, try the softer things first, and then if it's not working, if you know you've got a high population, then pick an insecticide that you know is pretty is pretty safe for our beneficials right. out there. Right. Well, and like kind of the downside to the ladybugs, it was awesome. You go buy a container, you let them all out, and you're, that's great. My aphid problem is solved. They'll devour all the aphids, they'll eat them all gone, and then they'll go. Or they'll go to the next Then the ladybugs will go somewhere else. Yeah. So. It's fun to have, you know, it's fun to go buy a package of ladybugs with your kids and put right. them out in the garden and, you know, let them, let them crawl on the plant. They don't do a lot uh, in, in theory, you know, in, in real life, but they will get out there and feed a little bit. Right. And uh, they are, they're fun to, to show the kids that, you know, hey, these guys are going to eat these pests that, are, that, are, right. that they're feeding on. So um, don't, don't give up on them. I think, you know, I think, the, you know, look for the lace wings, look for the ladybugs, go, go find some. And, but protect those when you spray, when you're spraying, be sure right. and keep them in mind. Collateral damage. That's right. Minimize the collateral damage. So yeah, aphids. Bottom line, uh, just keep an eye on them. You know, you may have to spray that stream of water every two or three days. Uh, some insecticidal soaps or some horticultural oils, maybe weekly. 
Um, but again, like I said at the first, they're turning over uh, their life cycle every three to four days. So you may control one set, but then another set's right behind waiting in the action. So, or in your neighbor's yard. Or your neighbor's yard or that. But, but just be, you know, keep in mind, you will have to will have to scout these quite often. You will have aphids, but, you know, they're, they will, hopefully your, your uh, beneficials will keep them in check. Right. All right. Yep. Aphids. There it is. There it is. All right. So we'll move on to our plant of the week. Our plant of the week this week is one maybe some of y'all are familiar with. I wasn't until a few years ago. It's Joe Pie Weed. And it has weed in the name, you, you know, which can turn off some people. Right. So right. it's milk weed. Mil yeah. But yeah. anyway, but uh, I mean, you may have seen these along the side of the road and thought, oh, well, that's pretty. But I mean, they're a great garden plant. They're great for pollinators. And talking bang for your buck, these things will get like five to seven feet tall and maybe four feet across. And so you got this huge plant covered in all these pink flowers, pink flowers like that. Yeah. That's really pretty. That's a cool one. And That's it'll do cool that one. almost all of all, the, all all the time. summer. Yep. And you'll go out yep. there. I've got a couple of them. You'll go out there and they're just like butterflies flying, flying around and bees around. and stuff. So uh, it's a great one. Joe Pie Weed. Uh, it's pretty low maintenance. It's full sun or part shade. Of course, it'll do better in full sun. But uh, yeah, the, you'll get a lot more blooms in full sun. Right. Um, you know, maybe a protected afternoon, a five o'clock on protected should be fine. You know, right. for shade. But it, you know, it, the the sun, the more sun it has, it the more more flowers. Just like a lot of stuff. But it'll right. it'll put on some flowers now. It, it's pretty. It's right, pretty. But bang for the buck, like four or five bucks for a plant, and you get something five to seven feet tall. I consider that a good value. Pretty, pretty good value. <laughs> And it, a perennial, a perennial. I think you said that earlier, and right. and uh, it will, it can freeze back, but uh, you know, freeze out. But you know, I, I would I would call it a perennial. I don't think a tender perennial. I think a perennial is pretty solid. It's a pretty solid plant. All right, and we happen to have it in our online plant sale. So if you want to get you some Joe P Pie weed, go to our website tulsamestergardeners.org and click on the link and uh, search Joe or Pie or Weed, and you'll you'll and find it'll pop up. You'll and find it, it in and it'll there. pop up. Yep. So. Uh, Good plant. That's right. Give it a try. Give it a try. Give it plenty of room. Give it plenty of room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't crowd it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't like that. So now's the time. Now's the time in the garden. This is the time we've been waiting for. It is. It right. is. We're talking seed time. Seeding. We're starting our, starting our seed time. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, it's time to get going. We got it is. Some supplies I mean, here to, you know, we're with. we're about you know April fifteenth our magic day usually uh, as gardeners. Hopefully, it's going to be a, a right. good spring. Right. But um, that that gives us about forty five days to get our seeds ready. Right. So you know that's kind of where we're at first of March right now. So we need to we need to have those seed catalogs studied and you know pick out the plants that we're ready to ready to put in the ground and you know with with all of our sheets our fact sheets and things should be should be ready to go so get your seeds seedlings yeah, in the ground first step is seeds i ordered ordered my seeds yesterday uh -oh. these are last year's seeds okay. so i'm a little okay. late on the curve but i'm still i'm still going to get there yeah but yeah. get your seeds you got to get your seeds first and then you need Something to grow your seeds in. I like these peat pots. These are pretty nice because once they're in there, you can just cut these out and plant the plant put the, the whole pot. thing. Put in the there. whole thing in yep. there. It'll it'll compost and go into the soil. But load them up. We usually suggest like a, a potting soil. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, potting soil. Uh, there's all kinds of potting soil. When you when you use the potting soil that you want to use uh, for seeds is actually a seeding mix, a starting mix. Because what it is, it's ground up pretty fine. Right. Uh, that fine fine ground uh, really gets that soil to contact that seed to get it germinated. Right. So uh, that that helps, and that that you know, you know pick out a good quality peat or a good quality potting soil. Um, a new potting soil. Try not to reuse to do seeds um, because we can have some diseases that get in there, right. uh, and we don't need a lot at first. And then, then we can use that recycle. We can recycle that potting mix in our containers and our big going. containers once it gets going. Yep. But yep, a good starting mix peat is is good and, and hard to beat. Well, a tip on this stuff is is you'll go ahead and fill up your containers. Whatever this, I mean, you can use cups. You could use. Old yogurt, yogurt containers, containers, but I mean any kind of container you can use to start your seeds with. But fill them up with the, with this potting soil and water it and get it moist before you put your seeds in. Yeah. Because if you if you don't and you put the seed in there and you water it, it tends to kind of tends to float. Tends, it tends to, to float, float and fill up. Yeah. And that's yeah. anyway. So get them get it moist before you put the seeds. Yeah, in. Yeah, that is a good point too, because there won't be much moisture at all in that bag. No, it's so. dry as a bone. Yeah. yeah. And then when you water it, it it tends to tends to want to float. It's just just because it doesn't doesn't wet that well until we it doesn't absorb it that's that right. well until that's we get right. going. But anyway, you get your seeds in there. Typically, 
uh, these kind of things comes in a tray. You get a get a cover to keep it kind of contain your moisture. Kind of a greenhouse. Kind of a greenhouse cover. thing. Yep. Yep. It holds the moisture in there. This will get fill up. It'll get all moist and droplets. You can mm -hmm. tap on it and it'll fall, back, fall down. back down. And then lighting. You need a good light source. So we don't need light to germinate. We right. need and for most plants, but we need light once we start seeing those cotyledons, those first true leaves. Once they come out, then then we need some light. Uh, right. We've got a lot of options with light, whether it's just kind of a windowsill that's kind of a bright area, uh, or actually, you know, a full-blown LED lights that are full right. spectrum. So, I mean, there's a lot of different options that we have lighting-wise, um, but the main thing is, is get them germinated and then get them, get them to the light, whether it's an artificial or a windowsill or things like that. Right, and, and you, as far as the germination process, you can actually buy a little garden Heating pad, heating pad yep. underneath here to kind of warm it up, so it kind of speed up that process a little bit because yep. it makes it seventy ish ish. That windowsill, you know, tends to be cooler. Right. Um, so I mean, you're probably in the fifties and sixties, so that it may not germinate very well. So that's where your or it'll, heating, or it'll take longer or longer rather than, rather than them popping up in two or three days. It may be a week. Or oh, two, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, again, you don't have to put it on a windowsill to germinate it, but put right. it in a warmer area, and again, try not to you know try not to get you know too much wind flow. But, you know, that's where that cover works pretty well, just to kind of hold the moisture in. And then once we start seeing those little little boogers germinate, then we can start moving them to the light a little bit. Yep. And uh, you can take that off, to, uh, turn off the heating pad after they've germinated. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you got to water. And I, I maybe I'm overprotective or something, but for these little bitty tiny little guys, I've got a little squirter and I'll, I'll squirt in there because... You know, we've got this kind of stuff. You get this and you start going, that's a lot of water yeah. being dumped yeah. on them. And they're tiny and fragile, so yeah. you can go and squirt around them and keep them, keep them moist. But, yeah. you know, that's just me. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm probably not going to go that far. But, <laughs> but no, it works. I mean, yeah. it, it does. And, you know, the one thing <clears throat> to look for, um, when we start getting some tall seedlings, um, tall seedlings means it's li more than likely lack of light. Mm -hmm. So once it starts getting tall and spindly, um, we need to put some light on those where they'll start stiffening up a little bit and get, you right. know, staying kind of short. Um, so that's one, that's one thing that happens that I've noticed when, if we don't have enough light, they tend to try to grow up towards the light and you can't find it. Right. So. Well, and then even if, if you're growing something like, say, tomatoes, those tomato plants are going to start getting bigger and it's squash. Squash mm -hmm. will start trying to grow all around it. I mean, you can cut these out, take them individually, put them in a larger pot in, the, right, in there as right. well. To, if yep. you want to keep them inside a little longer, let them get bigger inside. Yep. So yep. a lot of things a lot of things you can do, but it is time. Now's the time to start getting ready. And we've got this, OSU puts out this fact sheet. We'll put it down there in the screen, but it's a 6004, it's the Oklahoma Garden Planting Guide. Mm -hmm. It has all the crops that you're going to be growing more than likely, uh, when to start them, days to harvest, where the uh, seed in the ground or trend, I mean, all, all kinds of stuff. All that information all is, and it's good for both warm season and cool season crops. So yeah. uh, click on the, get, get the link and, and download this, and this will be kind of your grower's guide. Yeah, and then even before that, I mean, our vegetable varieties for the homeowner, I went and found this today, and, and uh, this is a good fact sheet as well, 6032, and it, it has varieties. Right. Um, and I, I want to go bro grow broccoli. What kind of broccoli what do I grow? What kind of broccoli do I grow? So you pick this up and you take it. To the stores or you know online if you do the the you know your your uh, seed catalogs and things but these are the ones that work for our area and it, that's a good fact sheet as well to kind of get a pretty good idea you know on what what will work right it's okay to go rogue and just buy something you think is nice but if you've if you tried for a couple of years and haven't been successful maybe consult the Kind of the ones that are kind of guaranteed to do well. Right, here. right, right. So yeah, I mean, seed, seedlings, seedlings work well. Um, planting those, I, I tend to just go go buy my plants because I, I don't. I, I guess I find other things to do other than get seedlings ready. But you know, you, like you did, you ordered them, ordered them from a seed seed catalog that you couldn't find anywhere right. else. So you'll have those, and those will be the those will be the ones that you'll you'll be planting. So. Right, and I like to experiment. Do, yeah. You know, it's like, well, I've never grown that before. Let's, Let's try. try that. Yeah. And yeah. seeds are pretty cheap. So <laughs> seeds are pretty cheap. I got so a lettuce mix of seeds. There were 1,500 seeds in it for four ninety five. What That's, a deal. I got lettuce for the rest of my life. Probably <laughs> what a deal. if the seeds last as long. But, but again, we're first of March. It, it time, it's time. I mean, in general, about 45 days is about what it takes to get a seed right. from planting to kind of ready to plant. And what date should... Is our point so that April fifteenth is our right. major, April 15th. major day. Tax so, day, easy to remember. Tax day. So let's jump ahead a couple weeks, three weeks, four weeks. When we get ready to 
get ready to set these out. It, it's good to kind of harden these off a little bit. Right. You know, we're getting, say we're into March or April. Say we're into April, about two weeks before we plant. Wouldn't be a bad idea to set these outside uh, on nice days, under maybe under a shade. Don't put them in direct sun. Yeah, so it. somewhere outside where they'll kind of toughen up a little bit, harden off a little right. bit. Um, and then do that for about a week, two weeks, and then they're ready to go on the ground. Yeah, that's actually a, a question we get fairly often in our diagnostics. There are people like, I put my little babies outside and they just died right yeah. off the bat. It's like, well, did you harden them off? Did you, did I what? Yeah, what's harden off? And, yeah, what's harden off? And so for greater chance of success, you got to harden them off because, I mean, just they've been indoors in a nice protected kinda, environment, yeah. and then you go stick them out in the blazing hot sun, and they're <laughs> done. It's like, I don't like this life, and they're done. Or, or on the opposite end, the cold. The cold, the cold yeah. you know, because it, it, so both sides, and you know, another thing we didn't talk about is a fan. Right. Once we get, this is a good, this is a good picture here um, that we have. These are about ready to put a fan on. And what that fan, you know, an oscillating fan. Right. Uh, not just a direct fan, but a fan that moves. And that's going to, that's going to blow some air. That's going to kind of get that stagnant air out of there. It's going to toughen them up because they're going to sway a little bit. Right. And so that helps. So a fan's not a bad, not a bad thing, you know, after they come up, after they start, after they germinate. Uh, should be good. So right. just a little one, nothing major. No, you know, just enough where you can just kind of see the leaves flowing a little bit. Well, the great thing I, I like about start, starting seeds is just just do it. It's not a high cost investment. It's kind of a low cost probe. I mean, you can yeah. buy some seeds and save up some old containers and get you a bag of potting. I mean, it's like five bucks for a bag of the, the seed starting soil. Yeah. Give it a shot. Yeah. And then once you get them and you grow them, it's like, I started those I from that. seed. I did I didn't that. go, you know. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And kids, I keep bringing up kids. This right. is a perfect way to get kids involved. Well, yeah, they get to learn about how... You know, Where's they, our food come from? They're, they're more, they're more, bought, they're more bought in if they planted that seed and grew it, and it's growing a little bit. And then, all right, it's about time to plant. So then they start thinking about. It. But so yeah, get that with your grandkids, kids, whatever, your neighbors' kids. Get them, get them to plant something. You'll have, you'll, they'll have fun. They'll and have if fun. they don't like to eat their vegetables, they're probably going to like to eat these vegetables because they, they grew it. them. They did it. But so. They did it. So yep. anyway, awesome. Now's the awesome. time. Time to get busy. Perfect. Get after it and let us know how it goes. All right, so we got a couple of interesting questions this time. The questions of the week this week. The uh, first one is about cats. Uh -oh. People have a love-hate relationship with cats. I better but hold my tongue, Tom. Well, I've had cats in our home for 25 years. <laughs> but anyway, it's a love-hate relationship. Yeah. But anyway, so the question, when cats in the garden, cats can be yeah, probably they, in there. And that's what our question is about. Okay, this, this came okay. in a couple of weeks ago. It says, Mike... My neighbor's cats are using my garden as a litter box. Should I be concerned? This came from Lily. It depends. That's a good, that's a good question. It is no. a great question. Because it, they will use it as a litter box. I, I've got barn cats too, and, right. and I tend to try to run mine out of my flower bed. So I think, you know, as she said in my garden, and I, I wanted to I want to clear up, and we'll cover both. Is it a vegetable garden that we're going to be eating right. eating produce from? Right. Or is it just an ornamental bed that, you know, we're going to put mulch over and, and enjoy right. the flowers? Um, so, you know, probably, she's probably thinking vegetable garden I would think it would be my thought um, we'll start there vegetable yeah we'll, garden. we'll start there so we had this kind of a similar question come in last week they have six chickens in Tulsa um, they needed to clean out the, the the chicken pen and they were gonna put it in their vegetable garden and they got to thinking well there may be some disease from that manure from that litter that they can spread by putting it in their garden because we always say litter is great um, but there's a few things that we've got to be careful on. Um, in general, we say you need to compost chicken litter. Um, right. Any kind of manure needs to be composted, and whether it's the cat feces or whatever, but that composting is going to break it down. It's going to bring the temperature up, hopefully killing any E. coli or salmonella. Um, so once we compost it correctly, which we'll have to cover on another date, but once it composts, then more than likely we've got rid of all, a lot of the contaminants that would hurt, harm us. Now you're talking about chicken litter. We're talking about cat, it, yes, cat litter in uh, the garden here, which they can contain disease. They, right? Most yeah. definitely. Right. As, as Doing some reading, what'd you find? Roundworm, hookworm, E. coli, and salmonella can all be within that cat poop. So we need to get rid of all our cats. Well, that's not, I guess that would work, but that's probably not the best. Uh, anyway, but you, so yeah, you need to remove the, if it's a vegetable garden, you need to remove that cat feces out of there. Probably, would, probably wouldn't hurt. And, and, and 
if it came in contact with a vegetable that you thought you were going to eat, I'd remove that vegetable. Don't eat it. Don't I mean, eat it. it. Just not you know, this, a chance. these folks, you know, I was asking them what they were going to plant on the chickens, <clears throat> and they were going to plant, you know, it's potatoes and onion time. Right. So they were looking at potatoes and onions, and those are, you know, those are, you know, soil vegetables. So you're, they're going to come in contact with that soil. So that's that's where I really, really shied them away from putting that green chicken manure or the cat feces or whatever and put it in a pile and kind of compost a little bit. Let it set, let it let it come up to temperature, let it rest for a year. So the way we left our conversation was, you know, the, have that clean, go ahead and clean it out, but pile it up in the backyard and let it, let it set. They didn't have a compost bin, so a pile will be good enough. If they had a compost bin, throw it in, let it heat up, you know, and then work their magic on the compost and then go. But they didn't, so they're gonna pile it up and not put it in their vegetable garden this year because they were going to have potatoes and onions. That will come in direct contact. Another question, what about tomatoes or vegetables that are above the ground? I, you know, I think it will be okay if they put mulch down, keep that soil from splashing up. Just got to be cautious. Just just got to right. think about that. You know, you may have a vegetable garden 10 by 20 and, you know, you can, you, you can put other stuff in there, fertilizers, compost, that will be a guarantee that won't have that stuff, you know, salmonella, ringworms, all that other. So, you know, why not be safe, be on the safe side and, and either compost it or hold off on putting uncomposted feces in there? Well, then the, the basically how do you keep the cats out of the garden? It's basically a physical barrier. And yeah. cats are jumpers, so I don't know how you're going to create a wall it, high enough for the cat. But you can't get like chicken wire and put down... Lay it down it, flat. Lay it down flat because the cats aren't going to like that. They're going to come and try and dig it up and get ready to go to the bathroom and they can't yeah. do that. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's kind of abrasive to their feet. So yeah. Yeah. a physical so, barrier is about all you can do. It's about all you can do. And it's the same with wildlife, possums and skunks and things. I mean, it's the same. you you got to... You got to deter them away, and you know that chicken wire may deter them. And but you know, it, it's tough. It's harder, but right. just be careful. You know about all of the you know all of the diseases that it could bring. Um, but it's gonna you know it'll compost and make good fertilizer in a year. Well, and in the city, it's also people are not supposed to have their cats out running around. So maybe animal control might be the solution. But anyway, yeah, yeah. But, but I along. mean, again, I mean, they're they they use it as a litter box. You know, right. I'm, I'm thinking my flower bed, and you know, pretty nasty digging in the ground or garden and running your hand across a, a pile. But um, it'll happen. But I'm I'm not too awful worried about it in my flower beds. But vegetable gardens, eh? We we kind of I think a little bit more on that one. Right. Our when our kids were little, I had a sandbox out in the. Well, that's just perfect. That's perfect. That's, that's a litter box just for the cat. But anyway. Yep. Yep. Physical barrier is about all you got to got to worry there. All right. Next question is this. This picture came into the office here. Uh -oh. it's, uh, the guy want to know what the heck is happening to my peach tree. Well, you know about peaches, Brian, don't yeah, you? Peaches yeah, peaches are. Pe you know this this guy right here is a uh, it's a peach tree bore. And um, peach tree borers will, you know, if you're not protecting your tree, your peach tree trunk, then more than likely you are going to get a peach tree bore that attack. Right. It may take six months, it may take six years, but it's pretty much an inevitable that, that we will get a peach tree bore into that. So kind of the life cycle on the peach tree bore, it's a moth that's flying around in, in April, May time frame. Right. It's flying around to get a mate. And then once it finds a mate, it will it will it will mate and then lay its eggs. The female will lay its eggs on that trunk uh, about the end of May to June, all the way through the through the summer. Yeah. So starting about May through the summer is when we need to protect that tree trunk. We're going to protect that tree trunk with a a more than likely a chemical, a traditional insecticide that you know once that egg is laid onto that trunk and it hatches, it will start boring into that trunk. So it needs to become in contact with an insecticide of some sort right. to, to, to slow it down, kill it or whatever. Um, so, I mean, it will, it will happen. Like I said, it's inevitable. So one of the ways we control this thing is spray that insecticide on that tree trunk. And a lot of people come in and they're, they're needing a fruit spray anyway. They're gonna protect those you know, right. from insects and, and fungus. And what I tell folks is just to spray it, and we're gonna spray it every two weeks usually, let it spray, spray that trunk to run off. Mm -hmm. And that should give us enough chemical there to protect it against those peach tree borers. 
Well, I saw something. That one of the suggestions was to like get a knife and like dig and physically pop them out. That so, seems uh, so. There could be they. This one didn't go in very deep. He's right. probably just right in there. Maybe a piece of wire or something to kill it. But there may be others in there right. as well. And and um, I, you know, so that that can help. That's it seems about, like if you got one, you're gonna have. One. It is, but that's about the only way to kill them. That's inside there. This guy's been in there for a year, more than likely. He's mm -hmm. feeding and tunneling and traveling, and you know he, he or she, they're they're protected. That right. trunk's all around. That bark's all around, and you can't get an insecticide in there. So there, there's really no way to to, to control them once they're in there. But. Right. Back to the original, once you see that gum, gummy gamosis ooze coming out of that trunk, that is that tree trying to fix that wound where that bore has got in. Right. So once you start seeing that, it's a little late, but you do need to go ahead and start spraying that trunk along with that top on that, on that control. Because it's a period of time. Because it's a period of time, right. yeah. And again, timing, I, I actually did my, a research thesis on that, believe it or not. I knew when, that. when do these come out in Oklahoma? And we found about that end of May time frame is when we first start seeing those male moths. Mm. And um, so that, that, that they're going to find that mate, lay that egg, and then, and then hatch, and then start boring in. So it's got to be protected right. about May on, uh, essentially. So it sounds like the key is prevention rather than treatment once yeah. it's happening. Yeah, it's hard to treat once they're in there, Yeah, right. for sure, for sure. All right, well, there you go. That wraps up this uh, episode of the podcast. We hope you're enjoying it. Continue to email us questions, and we'll cover your questions on the air, and uh, we'll see you next time. Happy planting. <laughs>